This is Laura Cross of Rebel Seed Films and Entertainment. I'm the writer and producer of the short action war drama Devil Dogs. And in today's podcast, I'm talking with veterans organization Flatline Fighters. Today I'm having a conversation with Anthony Droz. Anthony is a U.S. Marine veteran and founder of Flatline Fighters and The VET, which stands for Veterans Expeditionary Teams. The goal of Flatline Fighters is to seek out those affected by traumatic experiences who suffer from PTSD, adjustment disorders, or depression, and bring them together in an environment unlike any other. One of the key focuses of Flatline Fighters is extending the camaraderie and brotherhood after taking off the United States Service uniform for the last time through getting together for meetings, hangouts, and time on the rifle range. Through the VET expeditions, veterans use their training from the military, physically challenge themselves, and connect with fellow veterans to discuss anything that may be plaguing their transition to civilian life. Besides expeditions, these teams are also active with obstacle course training and event racing to challenge and push veterans mentally and physically. Hey, Ant. Welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you here. How are you? I'm doing great today. Hey, I want to jump in and ask you about uh, how the heck you got became a Marine. What inspired you to walk that path? You know, I think I think being in the military was always something that was going to happen to me. Uh, my father was in the military, he was in the Army. My grandfather was also in the military. He was also in the Army. And I think for me, just going to the Marine Corps is kind of me, you know, choosing my own path in a sense. Um, so, you know, that that's why I chose the Marine Corps. You know, I definitely wanted to serve my country, but I, I you know, I was a 17-year-old kid. I kind of wanted to do my own thing in the same sense. So at 17, you joined the Marines, you went through boot camp, and then where did you go? After boot camp, I got sent to School of Infantry because my MOS was 0311, which is infantry. Um, So I went to Camp Geiger in North Carolina, and then after that, I ended up getting sent to 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, which is also in North Carolina, right at Camp June. And so when was that around? We were already, obviously, in the Iraq War, Yeah, absolutely. This was in 2006 is when I enlisted into the Marine Corps, and I got to my unit, um, I think, I believe in the end of 2006. And then you did a tour of duty then in Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, my first tour of duty was in Iraq in 2007 to the Alambar province, uh, more generally uh, Ramadi. Um, After that, came home, um, trained up for another deployment, and then I left shortly after to my second deployment. Um, which I was then transferred to uh, Intelligence Battalion to be a personal security detail for counterintelligence operatives. Oh, well, tell me a little bit about that. That sounds interesting. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. It was actually it was an amazing, amazing experience to be able to see the other side of the fence and to see how special operations um, is conducted. Uh, normally, typically, as a, as a regular infantry Marine, you're not exposed to those sort of things. So it was it was very eye opening and it was it was an honor just to be able to work alongside uh, you know people uh, who directly influence national security and and their jobs are just are are amazingly difficult and and very 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 um, just just tasking. So you know I was I was honored to be able to work with them. And so did you just you served two tours and then you came back home or what was your trajectory there with the with the Marines? I served I served two tours uh in Iraq in 2009 was my second tour so when I got home I had um, you know maybe 5 or 6 months left on my contract in active duty so uh my unit was slated to deploy to Afghanistan after that um so you know they deployed I ended up getting out of of the Marine Corps in 2010 and then things shifted significantly for you when you came back home right you had oh, a, yeah. some challenges readjusting. Yeah, I, you know, I, I came out of the, I came out of the military, and I, you know, I thought I had everything figured out. You know, I just, I didn't want to be in the Marine Corps anymore, and that was about as much as I thought I had figured out, I suppose. And you know, just when you're when you're in the military, you know, you have a sense of purpose. You have you have things that you need to get up for in the morning to train for. You have that camaraderie. You have that brotherhood. You have structure. 
in the infantry, in the Marines, we like to drink a lot. It's definitely a, it's definitely a well-known factor of, of infantry life and of Marine Corps life is, you know, hanging out with your brothers and drinking. And, but you also have those things that you need to still get up for. Once you get out of the military, you know, you lose all of that all at once. Except and, for the you drinking know, part. You, you may, yeah, exactly. You except except, except for the drinking part. You hold, you hold on to that. You don't realize that. You know that it's not okay in, in civilian life to drink the way that you do in the in the Marine Corps in the military. And once you stop having to have reasons to get up for most most guys who come straight out, unless unless they're married, the married guys normally have to fall into a job, and they know that. So for single, for bachelor, for bachelor veterans, when you come out, you know you don't you don't have to. You can toy around for a little while. You can you can figure out what you want to do. But in that time time frame, you know you, you don't realize that you're just straight damaging yourself. Mm-hmm. And you know that's what I did. I just I got out and I lost all of those things all at once, and I felt really hard on my face. And you know I had I had lost you know I lost friends that I served with in country, and you know I just it, I just like I I didn't understand. You know I, I guess it really never hit me until I got out and until I was all by myself that you know why wasn't it me. Um, you know, so survivor's guilt, I guess, kind of really just just took me down a notch. Um, you know, I, two guys that I had served with, they went to Afghanistan and they didn't make it home. And I just was very much filled with regret that I didn't go on that deployment. And I felt like, you know, maybe if I would have been there, then just something would have changed. I would have been that person taking that left step towards an IED as opposed to them taking it. Um, and, you know, it just it really messed with my head and drinking was... Drinking was the way that I decided that I was going to just kind of put it all in that bottle, and it didn't work out so well for me. So what happened when you started drinking so much? Were were you challenged to maintain your relationships and jobs, anything like that? I think I think it's safe to say that every relationship that I ever had in my life at the point when I got out in 2010 began to crumble. I pushed family away. I pushed the person that I was with, um, in a relationship with at the time, completely away. And I just isolated myself as much as possible because I just had the mentality that nobody could possibly understand what I was going through and nobody possibly ever would be able to understand. So I just literally, like, I would I would drink a bottle of Jameson almost, like, every night or every two nights. And Holy shit, that's I didn't. Yeah, it was not... Like Jameson is Jameson is not an easy an easy thing to put down, and I was just like water to me, and I would literally wake up in the morning and I would drink a beer with my breakfast. Like it was, and it was like this for three years. Um, over the course of three years, I managed to get myself two DUIs, and at that point, I was facing criminal charges because, I mean, I didn't. Luckily, I thank I thank God every day that I didn't hurt anyone, you know, throughout this entire just destructive path. Other than obviously the relationships and feelings of family and friends. Were you reaching out to any of your Marine brothers, or at that time, were you staying in connection with them, or really just no, you know, completely alone? You know, they they were there. You know, I I didn't want to. It's kind of like you know that they're there, but you feel weak if you ask. And I feel like that's the mentality that a lot of veterans have throughout everything that they go through. They know that they have brothers there. If they would call, they would come in a heartbeat. I knew that. But I just felt weak for asking. I felt weak for telling them, hey, you know, I'm just going through it right now. I need somebody. Just I just need somebody. And I just I didn't want to because I felt weak for asking. You're, you're put in that position where, you know, you feel like if you talk about your emotions, you talk about your problems, you talk about what you're going through, it makes you lesser of a man in some way and less of, less of a Marine, less of a veteran. And... So you just keep it to yourself. And, you know, obviously everyone around you can just see that you are just destroying yourself. But, again, they either feel like they can't say anything or even when they do, the first quick comeback is how could you possibly understand? Mm -hmm. And they can't. So how can they help you? So what would you say was the incident that started to shift things for you and turn it around? Well, in... In 2012, in I have to say this off the bat, in a completely unrelated alcohol incident, um, I, I wrecked a street bike really bad. I just like a lot of veterans. I feel like a lot of veterans, if they don't have street bikes, they get them when they get out, and they're just chasing that adrenaline. 
Um, so, you know, I got a street bike, and I always said, hey, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to ride, but I'm going to be a smart rider. Like, I don't need to go 120, 130, 140 miles an hour. That fades really quick. You start to push your limits. You start to you start to get cocky. You start to get way too confident on it. And there's there's a saying about riders, and it's those who have been down and those who are going down. And on in August of 2012, I went down pretty hard. Um, I broke every bone on the right side of my body. I collapsed my lung. I had a serious traumatic brain injury that really messes with my memory. I had retrograde amnesia from it. Um, what else? I had a I broke my leg, my right leg, so bad that they had to emplace metal hardware to save its mobility. Um, I have a solid steel rod that goes down through my leg, and it's secured by a, a plethora of screws. Um, so, you know, I was really messed up from that. But honestly, that, like, it kind of... And, and the reason that I think that I got in that wreck was I was just you know, on a really serious binge in South Carolina at Bike Week. And when I got home... I just, I can't even really remember anything because of, you know, because of the brain injury, but, like, I just know that I probably was really, you know how it is, like, after you, you're drinking all weekend and you're just really kind of still in it and you're just tired and your 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 responses are slow, so I, I probably was just just out of it when I crashed. I can't really remember, but I'm, I'm assuming that's what it was. I, I literally was binge drinking for an entire weekend in South Carolina. Um... So, you know, that kind of slowed me down, but I, when I was in the hospital, the nurses were like, you know, this should be nothing for you. You went to Iraq and like, that just like set me off. Like I checked myself out. I checked myself out of therapy early. I didn't ever finish my therapy for my leg injury. And I just went back to just, just slamming myself with alcohol. Like I just, I just continued down that path. Um, so I guess to answer your question, you know, the thing that really started to just kind of slow me down was my family. Um, I, I I don't know how, how big of a family you have, but I have an extremely big family. I have, like, seven sisters. I have a brother. <laughs> I have uncles. I have aunts. I have, I have a huge family. And when everyone in your family gets in one room and surprises you and they ambush you, what's, what's that word for it? A, so uh, an, an intervention? They <laughs> yeah. An intervention? Yeah. Yeah, they fucking surprised me with an intervention, pretty much. Um, they just, like, ambushed me. You know, they were like, hey, come over for dinner one day. And I went over, and I knew right away that, I was, that, that they got me because I walked in, and my uncle was there. And my un- my father passed away when I was little. My father was also a veteran, and he actually took his own life when I was, when I was very young. Um, so my uncle, growing up, was always like that, that stern force. You know what I mean? Like, whenever I was really bad... Like, they would call my uncle for an ass whooping. And so as soon as I walked in the door, I saw my uncle, and I was like, oh, man, like, they got me. And so I am very good at controlling my emotions. Um, but that day, like, they just, like, when everyone in your family sits you down and they just put it all on the table, like, there's very few men in this world who are not going to be affected by it, you know, like. My sister's telling me that, you know, they wanted me to be there for their children in the future, and they didn't feel like that was going to happen if I continued down my path. My little sister, who I adore so much, I I love her to death, and, like, for her to tell me that, like, she wants to be able to look up to me, but she can't right now, like, just crushed me. And, you know, after that, I kind of tried to shake it off, like, whatever, they're just being, they're just being family. Like, they don't know, they don't, I'm not doing, I'm not that bad off. And I had one of my one of the Marines that I served with on my second tour. He became literally like my brother. He called me and he was like, you know, we need to we need to do something, man. Like we need to do something together. You're just you're spinning out of control. Let me ask you, you know, why do you think that you resisted for so long and allowed yourself to spiral down so far? I just really didn't feel like I was, I didn't feel like I was that bad off. You know, like when you're in the military, you're used to drinking that much. Mm. I didn't feel like I was doing anything, you know, really wrong. Like I told myself, hey, you know, this is just, I earned this. Like I earned this time to be able to just live life. But what I didn't realize is, you know, I was living life, but I was ruining my future. Like I was getting DUIs, you know, I was, I was ruining my career. I was almost halfway through the degree, a degree for criminal justice and it was going to be useless. Mm-hmm. Um, I was pushing all my family away. Like, I was just literally ruining 
my life. Like I, I did this amazing thing. You know, I went and I served my country and I, and I did it proudly and I got an honorable discharge and like that sets you up for so much success. But I was just completely ruining it because I was just too stubborn to ask for help. Like I just felt like either no one cared, no one understood, or I would just not be as, as much of a man if I asked for help. And, you know, that's, I think that's, I think that's why, you know, I just kind of just drifted for so long. I mean, obviously three years is, it's a pretty long time. You know, there's obviously there's Vietnam vets and who didn't have the things that we have, who, who drifted for decades. Um, but, you know, so, so when, when my friend really came to me and he sat me down, I went to the VA. Now, I'm not one to bash the VA. I don't really get into the political thing. <laughs> but I sat down with a therapist from the VA, and it lasted 45 minutes. And I was, like, done with it. This guy was just, you know, 30 years older than me, 40 years older than me. He wasn't a veteran. He used some key terms that I know all veterans hate, like, I know what you mean, or I can understand that. And I was done. I can tell you right now, or I was done. I just didn't want to hear it. So after the intervention and after this session with the VA therapist, what got you onto your path? What what brought you back? There is a man by the name of Jonathan Agee out of Allentown Outpatient Clinic Veterans Affairs Hospital. He is an addictions therapist there. Now, John's John's image... When I first met John, I thought John was a patient there. John is a really large man who has tattoos everywhere and he's got dreadlocks. Now, I literally, I'm not kidding you, I shit you not, I thought he was another veteran just there for treatment when I first met him. But he, when he opened his mouth, just nothing but education and, and inspiration came out of his mouth. Like, it just, the two didn't match up, you know what I mean? Like, like the old time movies when you like see like someone talking and then like Chinese comes out of their mouth and their mouth is still moving. That's literally how it was. And John just, because of his appearance and because of how he approached me, and he was a veteran, by the way, I could relate to him. I could talk to him. I can, I could just, I could open up to him. And it just, it was like a freaking, like a gateway. Like after that, like I just, I took his advice on a few things. One thing led to another. I ended up going out on an expedition for seven days with an organization that um, does expeditions for veterans. Um, it was completely free, um, and I got to go with one of the guys who I served with. They let you pair up with each other. And, you know, he lived in Michigan. I lived in, in Pennsylvania, but they let us go together. So on this expedition, you know, you, you're not allowed to drink or anything like that. So I was sober for the entire seven days. And at the end of the night, you know, they always pose you a question about life. And you have to really think about it. And for the first few days, you're obviously everyone's a bunch of smart asses because everyone's veterans and everybody's kind of struggling. So, uh, but after that, you know, you form these bonds with each other while you're out on, we were, we did a kayaking expedition, uh, in the Gulf coast. Um, and so, you know, you have to work as a team to, you know, get through, get through the, the expedition. So you kind of, you know, you break down those walls that everybody has. And, you know, by the fourth, fifth, and sixth, seventh day, the questions got like real serious and, we got to really talking about things and I got to look around this group and like guys had families, guys had kids, guys had wives, guys had, you know, so much to live for, but they were drinking it away or they were, you know, doing drugs or they were, you know, being abusive or, or whatever their own story was. And like, I just saw that, like, like I didn't have it that bad. You know, like I really didn't. Like I, I didn't have anybody that I had to, worry about providing for when I got out. You know, I didn't have all those stressors. Like, that, you know, what we were doing out there, it just felt right. Like, what we were doing out there, we were helping each other. Like, we were we were still in. Like, in that moment, we were still in the service. Like, we were, we were veterans, but we were still brothers. You know, we were still brothers and sisters, and, like, we could help each other. And it just changed my entire outlook and my entire perspective on things. Um, so when I came home, you know, I just... I threw every bottle of alcohol in my house out, and, and and that's where my story began, I guess. So let's talk about Flatline Fighters, which you founded. 
as a social yep. media site for yeah i decided me and uh me and a high school buddy of mine he was also in a serious serious motorcycle accident we decided that we were going to write down our stories and we were going to do a spartan race um you know he was in a very serious motorcycle accident he actually flatlined twice hence where flatline fighters uh originated um so you know we just wrote down our stories and we kind of sent it out to a few companies um and it just like one thing led to another. We ended up making a Facebook page. People loved it. They loved our story. They loved that we wanted to try to complete this amazing physical activity. For those for those people listening who don't know, Spartan Race is an obstacle course race that is just amazing. The brotherhood is amazing. The race is hard as hell, and it just challenges you mentally and physically. So you know we wanted to do one of these things. And and like I said earlier. I never finished therapy for my leg. So, like, my leg was, like, done. Like, just completely almost useless to me. Like, I'm very fit, and I'm... And if you look at me, you swear that I was in the gym all the time, but I really wasn't, and, like, my leg was just useless. So I had to train up for this thing. So, you know, that's what kept me, like, sober. So I I started training for this thing. You know, the social media kind of went off in a completely different direction. Once people found out that I was a veteran, it ended up kind of taking hold, and it just kind of formed, like, this weird... This weird, this weird almost like family on social media of all these people who had been through something traumatic in their life. And all these people just like started to cling together. They started to share stories with each other. They started to compliment each other and motivate each other, inspire each other. And that's where, that's where Flatline Fighters started. And, and it's amazing. It's just, it's an awesome thing just to be able to to do all these things and then share it with them via the social media. It's just awesome. And then that morphed into, well, not morphed, but then uh, evolved into um, your Veterans Expeditionary Team. Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's called the VET. Um, It stands for Veterans Expeditionary Team. Um, It changed into that. That's a nonprofit that I started um, I basically, I go out with veterans who are either struggling or who just, you know, need that brotherhood or just, you know, you need to get away from the wife and kids for a weekend because they're going stir crazy. Uh, so basically we go out for like two and three day expeditions. You know, um, I'm in Pennsylvania, so we try to operate in New Jersey, New York, PA area. We'll do like a two, two day expedition for kayaking where we'll go like, we'll take the Delaware River for 65 miles um, but downstream and we'll camp out, we'll throw axes at trees and have fires and bullshit with each other and tell stories and talk if you need it. I mean, it's just, it's a real free environment and, and, and free is the key word there because everything is free. You know, everything is funded and paid for. We have different sponsors who help out, uh, Etho Vessel, Camelback. Um, you know, we, we have awesome supporters, um, who just, who, who just make it all possible. Um, it's 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 just like an experience like I can't even I can't even tell you, you know just having a bunch of veterans out there you know we get to do some of the things that we got to do in the military that we might have hated um, <laughs> at the time but like now you you think about those things and you're like man I'd really like to go on a hike with a bunch of guys and but not have to follow the rules and regulations that were imposed on me in the military I'd like to be able to drink a beer beforehand or, or do this or do that so the event is definitely uh, evolving in, in itself right now and changing. Um, we just started a, a partnership with the Warfighter Foundation, who's another another nonprofit, and we are sending a group of combat wounded veterans to Mount Everest, actually, um, on a therapeutic expedition. Um, that's going to be really groundbreaking. Yeah, veterans. tell us about that. I know that you did a, a 50 mile hike recently through the night in Philadelphia to help raise funds for that, right? Oh yeah, that was a bad idea. Hindsight, <laughs> not so good idea. Um, I, I literally, I had, I had everything going, you know, I had so many things started and I was like, like nothing is just catching the attention of like media, you know, 22 veterans are killing themselves every day. Nobody gives a shit. Like, why is, why are they talking about what Kanye West dumbass did on a movie show? Like nobody cares. Like, so I was like, you know what, I have to do something crazy. And I called up one of the Marines that lives next to me. Uh, his name's Joe. And I was like, Joe, you want to hike 50 miles through the middle of the night with me to a Spartan race? And he was like, sure. And I think he thought I was kidding at first. That's why he said, like, okay, so fast. 
but I wasn't kidding. So we did it, and you know, like we literally walked with with a ruck on our back, which had about forty pounds in it. We walked from Ottsville, Pennsylvania, all the way to Citizens Bank Park in well, Ottsville, Ottsville in Pennsylvania. Citizens Bank Park is in Philadelphia. So we walked from Ottsville to Philly, straight through the middle of the night, no sleeping, no breaks, no nothing. I, I'm lying. We stopped to change socks and stuff like that, but. So we walked through the middle of the night. We got to Citizens Bank Park. Spartan film crew was there. Again, as soon as Spartan heard that I was doing this and why I was doing it, they were on board. They they didn't hesitate. You know, the president of the company immediately was informed, and he put his news crew, uh, his film crews on it. Um, you know, they did an interview when we got there. They followed us around, took pictures. They did an interview after we were done, and they fully supported us the entire way. So, again... Please check out Spartan Race, and, and, and I always thank them for, for their involvement. Um, we were able to raise $5,000, which is going to go to send not one, but two veterans to Mount Everest. And we also raised a hell of a lot of awareness for uh, rising veteran suicide rates. So I I was, you know, I got nothing from this. You know, I mean, I got the satisfaction of knowing that I'm helping my brothers, but I, I got nothing, no kind of monetary value from this. I didn't get paid. I just did it because... It had to be done. Well, it sounds like you're doing, you know, flatline fighters and and the vet because um, it's something that you're driven to do. It's fueling you. It does. I think it keeps me. It keeps me on a good path. You know, I have my family and I have my friends, and I've learned a lot about articulating my feelings through writing and through, and, and you know, and through speaking and speaking engagements at the VA and at you know DFWs and things like that. But more than anything, like, this just keeps me, it keeps me getting up in the morning. You know, knowing that by me getting up in the morning and me going out to a race, that people are seeing it and they're like, you know, like, n- like nothing, like, his accident didn't put him down. You know, it's, it, the battle of PTSD with anxiety didn't put him down. Like, maybe I can do this. And, like, through that, I've met amazing people, amazing stories. And I bring each one of those with me every time I go somewhere. So, yeah, I definitely think, it, you know, it definitely fuels me. What would you say is your mission for your your nonprofit? I feel like it's ever changing and evolving, but it, first and foremost, I'm a huge advocate for for spreading awareness for veteran suicide rates. Losing 22 veterans a day to suicide is simply un unacceptable. You know, if we could get you know celebrity endorsers and speakers to talk about it. You know, it would be put on the forefront of everybody's faces, but we can't. We have to do it ourselves. You know, the only people that are going to care about veterans is, is veterans and family of veterans, and that's that's the, that's the cold, hard truth. Um, so that's definitely one of my primary missions. And then the other one is, you know, is is helping guys who are struggling, you know, by, by doing uh, activities such as Spartan races and these expeditions that I like to do. Um I, I also act as a funnel. You know, I I know so much about all these organizations. Like, veterans don't know. I mean, veterans don't know that there's organizations that will pay for their gym memberships. They don't know that there's organizations that will help them out financially if they're in a rut. They don't know about, about, about the fact that you can go work in a state corrections and use your GI Bill for it while you train and get paid. Like, it, there's so many things that, like, we're entitled to as veterans, and there's so many organizations that are out there for us, and the only reason nobody knows about them is because, Nobody shares the damn information. So you feel that you're also a resource for um, veterans to come to to get direction. I hope so. I mean, I I I normally you know like when somebody messages me and they ask me something, if I don't know the answer, I'll post I'll post it on my Facebook and and tag like as many people as I can until I get the answer. Like I I don't I don't ever want to not help one of my brothers or sisters who you know took the same oath as I did. You know, we're all the same. I don't ever, I don't care if you've never been to Iraq, period. You know, and you ask me a question, I'm still going to help you. You still stepped up. You still took that oath. You know, it doesn't matter to me. But, um, what, what would you say to veterans who may be struggling um, about being proactive and uh, about addressing what's going on for them? Maybe they don't have a family that's going to stage an intervention. Um, maybe they're not drinking or or doing drugs to excess but they're they're just struggling emotionally what would you say to them to help them turn things around before they spiral down even further 
I'd say I'd say think about every single person who's ever put on that uniform and paid the ultimate price for it. I'd say think about them. I think about them. Think about their families. Think about their kids. Think about their brothers, and honor them. Honor them. Do something with your life that they wouldn't have been that they weren't able to do because they paid that sacrifice for us. So all I would say is just honor them. If you can't find the if you can't find the motivation to do it for you, if you can't find something in yourself inside your life that is worth getting off the couch for, do it for them, because they would be doing something with their life if they had one. Mm-hmm. That's great. Um, so, how do people who want to get involved in these expeditions? What's the what's the first step? What do they need to do? Oh man, go to Facebook and then go to Flatline Fighters and message me. You know, um, that's first and foremost, if you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, just message me. I'll school you up real quick. I got no problem with that. <laughs> um, other than that, you know, you can go to SpartanRace.com to check out, you know, what kind of events they have in your area. They do them all over the world, literally. Um, if you want to do expeditions, if you want to do something like what I was talking about earlier, get in touch with me. If, if I don't have an expedition near your area, I'll put you in touch with someone who does. Okay. Um, I definitely have no problem with that. And we've got all the links uh, down underneath the podcast that you can just click on for that. And if there's people who who want to get involved, um, maybe they're not veterans or they're not they don't want to do expeditions, but they want to support what you're doing. How can they do that? Also, same, same thing. Get in touch with me. You know, there's always there's always ways that you can run that you can run races, you can do hikes, you can raise money, and you can donate it. Um, you know, people are very hesitant to just you know, go to a website and click donate. But, you know, if, like, if you're doing something, if you're being active and you're raising funds, you know, through, like, a GoFundMe or, or you know, Athlete.com, if you're doing one of those things, you know, then people are more more likely to, you know, give you $10 a mile or $5 a mile or, hell, even 50 cents or 25 cents a mile. That's how we raise the $5,000. It's just simple stuff like that. Um, there's a million and one ways that you can get involved. Um, one of the biggest I'm, – I'm a huge, huge supporter for Operation Enduring Warrior – um, they're a nonprofit who um, they take guys out who are physically um, wounded from from combat, and they help them complete races like Spartan Race, and, and they help them do these hikes and stuff. And they just show like it's just I can't, I honestly like you have to Google them and you have to watch these videos. Like these guys with you know missing limbs like complete these these rucks and these hikes and these and these obstacle course races with teams of veterans who have all of their limbs and they just, they help each other and they inspire so many people. Like they just stand for everything positive about the veteran community. And, you know, they are just amazing. I, anytime I ever feel like in the morning, my feet hitting the ground, isn't going to do anything and it's not worth it. I just think of one of those guys and the fact that like they have crawled up mountains just to be able to show someone else that it's possible. And there's no damn way that I'm not getting out of bed that morning when I think about those guys. Yeah, what motivation, what inspiration. Hey, and I know that this past weekend you had another event in Ohio for a paralyzed man. <laughs> oh, my God. Why did I, you know what, I like I say yes to these things, and I'm like like halfway through it, I'm like, why the hell am I here? So Michael Mills, he, he, was, he was never in the military. Um, he was struck by a drunk driver when he was 16 years old. Um, and paralyzed from the waist down. Um, Mike, extremely patriotic man, um, would have served if he could have. It just wasn't in the cards for him, unfortunately. As soon as Mike met me a few weeks back, he's like, you know, thank you so much for your service. And, you know, a week later, I got a, I got a message from, from him and, and Zach, who is the, the founder of, a, of an organization called More Heart Than Scars. Um, they both called me and they're like, hey, come and do this Spartan race with us. And they freaking tricked me because they didn't tell me that, like, I was literally just going to be a mule for this thing. So basically when you have an athlete who is paralyzed and they want to complete a Spartan race, you have to pull them in a wheelchair the entire leg of the race. When you physically can't pull them, you carry them. When you can't carry them, they crawl. It's insane. It's amazing. It's inspirational. It's, it's pure determination that gets these guys through this. And so Michael Mills challenged this the founder of Spartan Race, Joe DeSena, to this race. Now, Joe is 
an extremely amazing man of high importance and, you know, very high on the social scale. And he took the challenge. Like, he didn't even think twice about it. He was like, absolutely. Like, I'll do it. And it was just amazing that somebody of that standing would would do something like that. You know, it's not very very often that you find people who are high on the social, high on the economical ladder that will do something like that. So I ended up being on Joe's team, and I pretty much pulled him through the entire Spartan race. Um, it was 12 miles through mud, through, like, up hills. It, it hailed. It rained. It was miserable. It was, like, 39 degrees in Ohio, and we did the entire damn thing. And, at like, at the end of it, we all, like, finished. We, we you know, we crossed, we crossed the finish line with our head, heads held high, and, and they, they filmed everything, and they took pictures of everything, and that will just stand as a testament to people who, no matter what your situation, no matter how bad it is, that you can get through this. I mean, there was two guys in wheelchairs who did this, and they they both, like, just, they wouldn't give up. Like, Joe wouldn't give up either. You know, they, they were just so damn competitive with each other. They wouldn't give up. Like, it got it got so cold. Because, they, you know, they can't get out of the wheelchair to move, so they can't produce their own body heat. So they were just sitting there freezing, and they, they wouldn't stop. Like, they wouldn't quit. They wouldn't yield. And I was like, at one point, I literally, I was like, do you want to throw this thing, man? Like, you're going to freaking have hypothermia. Why do you think that these um, expeditions are so important for veterans? Besides the camaraderie, is it giving a, a sense of purpose and a sense of accomplishment that maybe they have lost after they have left the military? I think first and foremost, every man that meets another man that he doesn't know, regardless of if you're a veteran or not, you have walls up and you're directly judging that person. You're already thinking in your head, what the hell did he know? What did he go through? What are his qualifications? But especially as veterans, we are just we're sizing each other up. We don't allow we don't allow ourselves to put our guards down. So these these expeditions, you're out there with, with someone, and you, you have to use teamwork. You have to work with each other, and you learn a lot about each other. And that just breaks down those walls, so you can be able to talk to each other about things that you wouldn't have had the opportunity to if you met him at the VA or at a bar or, or whatever, you know, like it's just the time. It's the unification of one common goal to get this thing accomplished. Same thing with Spartan races. It just allows you to break down those walls. And then obviously, yeah, further into it, at the end of a really long day, if I'm just completely shot out, I just feel like shit and I don't feel like, I don't feel like, you know, we continuing. And my last thought in my head is nobody understands. Now, let's say I just did a seven-day expedition, or let's say I just did a Spartan race with it with another veteran who lives three blocks down from me. I know he understands. We we freaking we bled, we sweat together on on these these courses or this expedition. I know he understands because I talk to him about it. I'm gonna give him a call. You know, I'm, I'm gonna maybe go over to his to his house and ask him if he wants to have a beer. And while maybe not asking for him to sit there and have a powwow with me, it's just the the connection, the brotherhood is there. It's back. You know, it's not gone. So I think that's that's where that's where they're money. That's where they're awesome. That's where they're helpful. Amazing organization that you have, FlatlineFighters.com. And do you have anything else that you would like to share? I I would just I would just encourage everybody to just follow one of our sayings that I've really adopted lately, and it's be the change that you want to see in the world. Plain and simple, be the change that you wish to see. If you want to see veterans stop taking their lives, get involved. If you if you want to see guys who, you know, put it on the line and return wounded, uh, accomplish amazing things, and, and if you feel they deserve to go to Mount Everest, you know, then get involved. It's pretty it's pretty simple. If you're if you're not if you're not doing something and then get involved, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world. Anthony, thank you so much for your service to our country, for supporting our veterans, and for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. 